Well, hello and welcome to Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. And we're taking a bit of a, an excursion this time from our normal fare, but that's okay because it's interesting in its own way. Um, we're doing a favour for a customer. He's decided to, uh, to change his collection a bit. So consequently, some cars are coming up for sale and he's asked us to, to prep them. And this is one of them. This is a Land Rover 110, um, a Defender, old shape as it now is Defender. Uh, it's still a pretty cool looking vehicle. But uh, what's really special about this one is it's got the most outrageous powertrain um, in it. It's a, uh, an LS3 engine, which was fitted uh, some years ago, 6.2 litre crated Chevrolet V8, but it's also got a supercharger on it. For those for whom 450 or 480 brake horsepower is clearly not enough, um, we have a supercharger bolted onto this, uh, which is producing north of 600 brake horsepower. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm a bit, a bit too minded about this car. I suspect it, it's, um, it's a sort of Marmite vehicle. You, you either think, ooh, that's wonderful, or you think, Mm. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, there's no in-between, really, but um, I, I like it because of its novelty factor. I really do. Uh, it's, it's slightly loud, um, to put it very mildly, um, but for those who want an alternative to the sort of Kardashian-spec G-Wagon, which seems every second car, if you walk around Monaco, you can hear them half a mile away, it is a Mercedes V8 engine G-Wagon. Um, but uh, this, is, this offers an interesting and alternative um, solution, should one be in the market for such a thing. Uh, it's, it started life as a 110 Land Rover, 110 inch wheelbase with the 2.2 litre Ford Transit engine, essentially. I think it's called Duratalk or Duratech, and it's a heady 122 brake horsepower out of the box, um, and it's mated to um, obviously Land, Land Rover's drive line uh, accordingly. But um, in fact, I, I haven't bothered to do the arithmetic, but I think um, it's this engine is nearly five times that power. Just think about that, a 500% increase in power. The Transit engine, the Dura Torque or whatever engine is 122 brake horsepower standard. It can be chipped up quite successfully to I think about 160, 170. As Carol, Carol Shelby said, there's no replacement for displacement. And um, this has certainly got it in spadefuls. It was done by a company called Wildcat in the roundabout 2016, the engine swap, and it's got a six-speed automatic gearbox with a very whizzy electronic um, automatic gear selector, push-button gear selector. Uh, Fassel Vega uh, came in with this, as did some American car manufacturers in the 1950s and 60s, where you, instead of operating a selector on the transmission tunnel or on the steering column, you actually press a button to, to select either park, reverse, neutral or drive, the four famous automatic transmission selectors. Um, on this, it's an electronic stepper system. Rolls-Royce were the first, I think, to bring in the electrical gear range selector, as they called it in the 1960s. And they did that to differentiate themselves from the, the GM Chrysler Ford standard quadrant that you sort of pulled towards you and then clunk, clunk, clunk down to drive that gazillions of American cars had on automatic transmissions. It worked very well, but Rolls-Royce went for a different solution, which was a tiny little lever, and you just literally fingertip, and the electric motor on the side of the transmission casing, GM 400, mostly, did the rest. I've never had to do any work on an electric motor in 40 years of working on Rolls-Royce and Bentley. I've never had to fix an, an electric transmission selector motor or the mechanism. Marvellous bit of kit. Anyway, I digress. It's come in for a cleanup. Um, it's running on uh, its standard, I say standard, uh, I presume they're beefed up in some way, front and rear axles um, with the famous swivel joints that Land Rover used at the front end. Uh, very clever system. It's been around since Land Rover's started life in 1947, 1948, something like that. Um, uh, in fact, most of the car is actually uh, related to what was around in 1947-48. The bodywork is aluminium. After the, the, uh, the Second World War, 
uh, when Land Rover came up with the uh, the concept of uh, when sorry when Rover came up with the concept of the Land Rover, they they used recycled aircraft parts, and uh, this was particularly aluminium. A lot of airframes, war surplus, Wellington bombers, etc., made with aluminium frames and they melted the aluminium down and turned it into sheet, which was then used on the Land Rovers. And that material was called Burma Bright because it was at the heart of the British motor industry at the time, the greater Birmingham area, Birmingham, Coventry, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, so this is still sheet aluminium. I'm not sure it's Burma Bright, whether it's Burma Bright or not, but you've still got the same chassis, front and rear live axles, um, we have actually graduated to coil springs instead of cart springs. <gasps> Be still my beating heart with the technology. There is something incredibly cool about an old shape Defender. I like the new ones actually, personally, uh, albeit that they're huge, but I like these. I've always thought, I ha used to have a Series 1 Land Rover, which was wonderful, and I've always quite liked them, but this is something different. I, I, I can't quite resolve in my mind how somebody can put 600 brake horsepower through an old powertrain um, which is essentially not built to take anything like that power. So I'm going to take it for a run but I'm going to be quite circumspect in the way I uh, in the way I drive it. I won't be doing launch control at 7,000 RPM, that's for sure. It's had the interior redone, the leather redone, um, some bits of it I think as ever with these modified big SUVs, some of it is um, is sort of within the tasteful and quite funky bit and some of it is utterly ghastly um, and there doesn't seem to be any middle ground. Uh, I'll let you decide which bits you like and which you don't. There are certain parts of this that I actually find almost offensive in terms of ghastliness, but um, Generally, I, uh, I quite like it, actually. Not sure I'd like to live with it, but uh, it's very noisy. Subtle, it is not. Um, if anything can put a V8 engined Mercedes G-Wagon to, uh, to, sh to shame in terms of exhaust, exhaust noise, easy for me to say, and boominess, it's this. We've got it into uh, to recommission essentially. We've um, we got a we found that one of the fuel, high pressure fuel hoses is leaking. Uh, we're going to give the the engine compartment um, a good a good once over. Um, just change all the fluids, that sort of thing. The spot plug leads have got a rather interesting. Um, the plugs are right next to the exhaust manifolds because of the uh, the design of the engine, the spark plugs, and they have a quite an interesting insulating material. It's not asbestos because that can't be used anymore, but it's sort of like a glass fibre type insulation, and it works incredibly well. It insulates the HT leads from uh, the the hot manifolds, and it's it's actually something. It's worth investigating whether we could use that on some of the other engines, like um, perish the thought, and I'm making purists. Uh, purists jump out of their seats and leap at the screen saying no but um, the likes of the Ferrari uh, 275 330 engines where the spark plugs are right next to the exhaust ports underneath the outside of the they were called an outside plug engine because the spark plugs were um, on the outside of the cylinder heads next to the exhausts as opposed to in the middle on the earlier inside plug engines like the Ferrari 250 GT engine we rebuilt for um, Chris Haynes from the Haynes Motor Museum um, some months ago. It could be worth looking at that because HT leads do suffer with the heat of being next to uh, exhaust manifolds, ignition leads, high tension leads. Um, but uh, actually it was quite interesting because whoever had last worked on this hadn't actually put two of them on properly. So we've had to fit a set of new spark plugs because they'd, uh, they'd only been getting half a spark really and hadn't been working properly. So it's very happy now back on eight pots. I do like the wheels, I have to say. There's one thing about it, these massive 18-inch alloy wheels, and um, they're Kahn wheels. I actually quite like them myself. I think they set the, the car off beautifully. The Santorini black paintwork, which I think is metallic. It's a very, very, very fine metal flake. Again, I think that's a super cool colour for them. We do need to just do a bit of tidying up here and there. Things like the the driver's door mirror, just the paint coming off there. A lot of car manufacturers with black fittings on them, particularly under the body, tend to just flash black paint over bare metal or bare aluminium, and that's good enough. The biggest problem 
with modern cars is that, 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 that send them to the scrap heap is, is not the engine and gearbox normally, um, provided they've been well serviced and looked after. It's, uh, it's, it's not the electrics, generally speaking. It's corrosion of parts underneath the car. Subframes, floor pans, because they are only given a flash of black paint or whatever underneath the car in certain areas, and that's what does for them. We had a, a BMW X5, first generation BMW X5 in the business here some years ago, and I enjoyed it. It was a, it was a diesel X5, it wasn't the fastest thing in the world, but it was quite a pleasant vehicle and it failed its MOT test here in the UK because of a rusty rear subframe. Again, just flashed over with the black paint um, and we thought at the time, is it worth it? Is it actually worth changing it and getting it through? And um, we concluded, no, it wasn't. So the car actually got sent to the scrap heap. Anyway, I digress. So we, we've been doing some work on this. Some, uh, Alex has been doing some wonderful uh, restoration work on some of the uh, visually pleasing bits under the bonnet. Uh, in other words, the covers that cover up all the, the gubbins, which modern cars have routinely. Uh, so we, we've been doing that, just cleaning it up. And um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll take it for a run and see how 600 brake horsepower through a pair of live axles actually works. Well, this is a slightly bizarre experience, it has to be said. Um, I'm just treating this with kid gloves. I'm barely touching the throttle at the moment, and uh, all seems to be well. <laughs> this is the first time this car's been on the road for a little while. Um, and uh, that automatic transmission, as ever with automatic American automatic transmissions, works very well. Uh, I think we're in fifth gear now, if I'm not mistaken. And the exhaust is quite loud. Um, I imagine outside it's very loud. But, um, yeah, the ride is not bad, actually. It's smoother than I was expecting it to be. But one of the funny things is about Land Rovers and Mercedes G-Wagons, um, for many, many years is the fact that they are so narrow. This is a very narrow car and uh, there's no elbow room to speak of. My right hand elbow is, is, um, is touching the glass here. There's, there is very little elbow room. They are not a wide car. Oof. <laughs> um, I'm driving like Miss Daisy at the moment and uh, I'm sort of rather frightened to open the taps on this because I feel a bit of mechanical sympathy towards those front and rear differentials and live axles, but I suppose at some point I've got to uh, goodness me that is um, quiet not I suspect we're gonna get some looks from these people now they're probably saying what was that three miles away that uh, caused that noise this is a different experience Woof. I mean, we bandy 600 brake horsepower around like it's normal. Um, and a lot of cars, I mean, it's far more accessible than it used to be. But uh, it's still a lot of grunt, 600 brake horsepower. Very interesting. This is a rather bizarre driving experience. I, I actually am finding it very difficult to describe what this feels like. Um, this, this uh, sort of scrunched up cabin, it feels like a mini strapped on top of a huge chassis and powertrain. That's the best way I can describe it. But it wants to go, you only have to touch the throttle and it's off. Uh, not to mention the noise. Um, okay, we'll just... I'm 
actually running out of comfortable road here. Um, oh, the brakes certainly feel um, confidence inspiring, but um, and it doesn't roll appreciably, which is a real surprise. Not often I'm lost for words, but this is crazy. It's surprisingly accessible. You can, uh, with this small steering wheel, you can position it on the road pretty well. It doesn't tram line with those big wheels on it. It's not trying to find its own way on the road. I can place it very well, which is amazing, actually. Um, and you only have to touch the throttle and it drops a slot or two or three and you're all uh, it's very different wow i think i'd probably want the exhaust a bit quieter if it was mine but uh, wow what a vehicle and it's got seven seats so um, if anybody is interested in buying it uh, again it's a slightly different way to transport you and your mates down to the pub at the weekend or on a summer's evening so much power it really has this is for the person who has everything I think that's probably the way I would describe it we'll just try it again oh. and the engine is actually coming alive it's years those spark plugs as I say were um, we're not actually working properly. They're precious metal tipped spark plugs in this, iridium tipped spark plugs. And it doesn't take much if a cylinder is misfiring or they're not getting a good spark. They don't tend to, uh, they don't like it very much. Um, they tend to, uh, to start packing up and failing and that's exactly what had happened with these. But it is definitely on eight pots again. But, uh, <laughs> oh. It feels like one thing I can't get over is how composed it feels. Um, I was expecting it to be. Um, to feel like uh, I wasn't really in in control of it uh, but it's remarkably apart from the exhaust note and the acceleration it's remarkably civilized um, I have to say I quite like this in a weird sort of way it's probably one of the most powerful if not the most powerful Land Rover conversions on the planet um, I mean Twisted who are um, Bowler and Twisted are the two uh, the two contenders for this. Uh, they do these modified Land Rovers. And Twisted, I, I spoke to Twisted. I gave them a call and said, "What is the wildest conversion that you do?" And it's 480 brake horsepower. Um, I think I think they said an LT1 engine, obviously another GM engine. But um, this is uh, this is a whole new level again with the um, with the supercharger on it but uh, wow I can't get over how how sweet it is to drive it actually works uh, I, I, ah, yeah I, it's it's I keep going on about the balance of controls when you're driving a car does the steering the weighting of the steering feel good um, does the self-centering feel good uh, does the Brit do the brakes feel about the same? And they do. It's all of a piece. It's remarkably. It's a well-engineered package. This. Um, and as I say, Bowler and Twisted have carried on the tradition. Unfortunately, um, Wildcats are no longer with us. But um, I can fully see the attraction of this. Um, yeah, it's just. It's just great fun. It's crazy, and I love it.
I've driven some I've driven some radical machines in my time but this is this is one of them let's put it that way <laughs> wow well that concludes another Tyrrell's classic workshop video I hope you've enjoyed it and we'll be back with something else very soon